Hi, John. Thanks for joining us. For the audience, we have John Ennis joining us. He is the co-founder and CEO of NeoSwap, a revolutionary new AI platform on Web3. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd like to um, figure out, you know, you know, today is about a, a, a founder's journey into Bitcoin and Web3. So let's, let's start from the top, John. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Um, you have a really awesome company that is going to be a game changer in many ways for Web3. But before you even did this, uh, can you tell us what you were doing before entrepreneurship? Mm, okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. First off, thanks for having me on here, Albert. Um, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in. So, yeah, what my background is, I um, actually, I've been working on NeoSwap for a long time. If you go all the way at the beginning, I actually got interested in the problem when I was 12. I think I've been over this with you, Albert, a little bit, where my father is a famous scientist and he was always running experiments on us when we were young. Like when we'd go out to dinner, we he would order all the desserts and then we'd have to taste them all and rate them. And he'd make he'd do some analysis and make a little chart to show how we liked the different desserts, do some, um, I don't know, trying to figure out what our preferences were, that kind of thing. On uh, Christmas morning, when I was 12, we came downstairs and there were no tags on any of the presents. And what my parents had done is they had bought presents for the kids, but they wanted to see if they handed them out at random, if we would, you know, trade them with each other and get the presents we were supposed to get. Okay. So they got me interested in the problem of multi-way trading. Because there was one Christmas actually where I had a doll that my sister was supposed to get. My uh, sister had a game my brother was supposed to get. And uh, he had some Legos that I was supposed to get. And so I took a piece of paper and I drew a little three-way trade and I kind of showed them. Actually, that's the origin of the NeoSwap like logo is that trade which was my first multi-way trade. Um, so that ended up getting me interested in multi-way trading. And so that was always in the back of my mind. Then as I grew up, I got my PhD in math. I did my uh, postdoc in computational neuro neuroscience. So I was doing AI in the actually early 2000s, um, you know, writing in that, I was actually writing Fortran programs back then doing um, neural networks. Uh, but after my postdoc, I went and I worked actually for my father's company as a market research consultant for about 10 years. And I think that even then I was starting to get a sense of what it was to be an entrepreneur because my father started his own company in 1994. And during the summers, I would work as an analyst in his company doing, again, Fortran programming um, to do analyses. And actually, in those days, Albert, I, you, actually, I don't know how old you are. I think I'm older than you, but uh, you might be old enough to remember that there, people used to have, to have to actually mail data to each other on disks. That's what it was back then, that a client would put data on a disk, put it in the mail, mail it to us. We would do the analysis. We'd mail it back and then we'd have a phone call to talk about it. So that's, that's the way it was once upon a time. Um, so even back then, I was kind of aware of entrepreneurship. And something my father did is he was always very open with me about how to run a company. You know, I mean, because it was a small business. Um, when I started to work for his company after my postdoc, he would take me into like the ins and outs because he was, you know, thinking that someday I would take over the company. So he would teach me about, you know, how do you do the books? Like how do you, every Thursday, he would do the so-called Thursday report where they would look at the cash flow and they'd look at the, you know, I learned that money in the bank is, I mean, you have, anyone out there listening to this, you must, must 100% always watch the cash flow. At the end of the day, as long as you have money, you're still in business. But once you're out of, running out of money, now you have a serious problem. So that's the most important thing, watch the cash flow. So that got me interested in that. Now, then I got in, really into, interested in AI and market research. And after about 10 years of working for my father, I decided that I really wanted to go out on my own, that I had my own vision for what I wanted to do. And so I started a company called Igora. Now, um, Igora is a successful enterprise AI services business, and it helps big companies, you know, CPG companies, like uh, it's consumer packaged goods companies, or sometimes consumer healthcare, that kind of thing, implement AI. So I was doing that for about four years. But in the background, I was always thinking about this multi-way trading problem. And in 2017, I wrote the first version of the NeoSwap algorithm. And I tried to do something on the side with Facebook Marketplace. And it just turned out to be way too hard. So I shelved it, started Igora. You know, Igora was doing well, um, I guess it was almost three years ago now, that I realized that Web3 would be a good place for us to be doing this kind of NeoSwap idea. And I pulled my head of AI and, uh, sorry, my yeah, head of AI and director of technology at Igora into a side project. And we were working about, part, you know, half time on NeoSwap, just inside Igora. So I basically started one company and then I used it to incubate my second company. So we were inside Igora for about a year. And then um, we were, we picked Stacks. We can talk about that. We we're showing what we we're doing to everybody on Stacks. And um, in the fall, sorry, in, yeah, in the fall of 20, 
21, we started to get a lot of support from the Stacks community for what we were doing. And we were invited to join the Stacks Accelerator, which we did in early uh, 2022. Founded NeoSwap, uh, I guess about 14 months ago now. And uh, then I've been doing NeoSwap full time. So that's been kind of my journey. One other thing I did is I started a nonprofit along the way. When I was working for my dad as a consultant, I was really interested in, I'm actually a national champion Lindy Hop dancer at the um, amateur level. And I started a nonprofit that was dedicated to jazz dance education with my wife. And I ran that for four years. So that was my first experience running an organization. Then I founded Igora. Then I founded uh, Neoswap. So that's kind of how I got to where I am now. Wow. Wow. Thanks for sharing that over be with us on how you eventually end up with NeoSwap. Yeah, that's also a pattern that I've seen. I mean, uh, my founder's journey is a, a little different from yours. Uh, my parents are engineers. Uh, one studied engineering, the other one studied um, medicine, um, but they never end up uh, like running like a business, right? And so my first three startups were like complete failures. Like there was a very steep learning curve for me. Um, right. but I have a lot of friends who are, you know, their parents, one of their parents was a founder and mm. they're, you know, it's like de-risk because you sort of just, um, you're in the environment. Uh, it probably comes up like in day-to-day life and that is in your mind, right? And so by the time yeah. those friends, they start their first business, it's um, very beneficial to investors because the learning curve is not steep, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And there's a much mm-hmm. higher chance to, to succeed because I, mm-hmm. I, I, um, the pattern I've seen is that actually, um, no matter what background we come from, the mindset to create a successful startup is the same yes. no matter what background we come from, right? It just takes mm-hmm. longer for some people to untrain themselves if they didn't have the habits mm-hmm. already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's the... Thanks for sharing me. I feel like I understand you better now. And I can also see, um, I always thought it was very impressive that your first business, you, you made money on it, right? And now you're doing a oh. startup doing very well. <laughs> yeah, so oh, thanks. now, yeah, yeah. I, now I know well. why. And there, there's definitely a pattern. It's definitely a pattern, right? And so, um, so, you know, I, you, there's a lot of things that, that, um, that I want to unpack. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting to me like your dedication to when you were 12 and how you're inspired and mm-hmm. even throughout your adult life, you're still trying to uh, solve this problem of, I guess, you know, if I want to simplify it down, correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost like um, how to effectively, effectively and efficiently allocate resources um, mm-hmm. to the people that want it. <laughs> so yeah. right, that's, 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 that's probably good. like the underlying, right? That's, that's um, there's a lot of sciences that try to um, make that more efficient. Um, mm-hmm. now, now, uh, what does, h- how does Neosop take us closer to that future? Mm. Right. Where, well, where, yeah. where, where, that, the efficient yeah. allocation of resources. Yeah, that's right. It's the, yeah, that's right. So economic economics is the study of the efficient allocation of resources. And that's really the central problem that Neosop solves is how to, how to reassign ownership of currency and assets within a group so that everyone benefits. Okay. And so inside NeoSwap, there are kind of two pieces. I mean, we actually have given an AI, a name to our AI now. Our AI, we call him Theo for trading helper for exploration and optimization. He's named after yeah. Van Gogh's brother, Theo, the art dealer. I think I've told you about that. Um, Theo has two main modules inside his kind of brain. Uh, one is a module for predicting individual utility. Okay. I mean, you think about market, like we're so used to a centralized market that we take for granted the price of things. People are always talking about price discovery. What's the price of an item? And for liquid goods, there really is a price. You know, there, there is a point where the buyers get the sellers, okay? What is in liquid? You mean like stocks? Liquid. Yeah, things that are, but that, that for which there is a large market, a large buying market. There is really, generally speaking, a market price, okay? But many, many assets are illiquid. In fact, I would, I would say, I mean, it depends on how you count things, but generally speaking, you have more illiquid assets than you have liquid assets. You have a lot of things that, are, for which there isn't necessarily a large natural market. And when you think about how much the different people in the world value those items, they value them differently, right? That even something that we would both agree has value, like um, you live in Los Angeles, is that right, Albert? Where are you at, California? Yeah, I'm uh, Orange County, close enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, as soon as you have some beautiful beach house in Malibu, right? That's going to be worth more to you than me because you could move there easily. Whereas for me, it'd be a big hassle. I'd have to uproot everything and move out there. So even though I agree it's a nice house, 
it doesn't have the same value to me that it does to you. So there's all sorts of examples like that in the world. And when you think about um, how do you, people own things. Now you want to reassign them. Like suppose you own that house in Malibu and then you get a job that's in you know Tokyo. Suddenly that house is worth less to you because you have to you have to leave. Now you have to find somebody else who values it. So the question is, how do you reassign ownership of items in an efficient manner without needing liquidity? That's the big problem that is always plaguing markets is the need for liquidity. Uh, in fact, you even see that with all the banking runs. You know, you have all this, you have a big liquidity crisis happening right now in the financial world. So we want to make commerce happen, and we don't want to use a lot of money to do it. Now, we do want to use some money, because if you don't have any money, you just have barter. There's all sorts of problems with barter. But if you can reassign ownership and fill in value gaps with money, you can get a very efficient commerce. And that's what we do at Neoswap. So we have individualized price prediction, and then we have multi-way trade discovery. When you put those together, you get this really powerful engine that you know, can look out, look down into like, the way I think about it is, if you had a market in the old days where everybody shows up with their goods at the market and you have some sort of God, think of Theo as like the God who looks down into the hearts of everybody and figures out how much do people value things. Theo could propose trades to the group. You know, say, okay, Albert, why don't you give these things to Trevor? You know, give these things to Kyle and Kyle give this to John and Trevor give this to, to John and John, you give these things to Albert and now we're all better off. That's the idea of NeoSwap is we don't need to sell all our stuff first, get money and then go buy stuff. We can just reassign ownership all at once in a more efficient way, and we all benefit. Yeah, no, I, I could sort of, um, we were talking about this before, how I could uh, imagine Theo, Theo as, a, uh, as a brain of, mm -hmm. a, um, of a robotic system, and then the robot would take inventory in your house, in your garage, and anything that's idle for a certain amount of time, it would earmark to uh, be put on the market. And then right. the AI would match it up with other people's stuff, right? And then mm -hmm. when they find a trade in real time, you can check off on it or deny it, right? And then that would probably save 95% of the resources we're using today. Like something- That's right, you, you, everybody, right. exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Just so walk, much we have to walk through our house. Walk through our house and think about. Oh, I, I don't need that anymore. I I needed it mm -hmm. like at the time, but not now, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably like ninety five percent of the stuff that we have in our house. Yeah, <laughs> in our and at the, in the office. industrials. Yes, and it's true of warehouses. It's true in the supply chain. It's true for inventory liquidation. There's so much stuff yeah. that would be more valuable somewhere else. We just need to figure out where it needs to go, and then we need to figure out some efficient way to move things around. So at scale, yes, Theo will be this brain of the global economy that's providing this whole second layer of commerce, which I believe can double the global GDP. I really believe that. And I can give you a mathematical proof of that. But that's my uh, view, is that all this stuff that is not moving can move. And we'll have a much more sustainable and much more inclusive economy. Yeah, maybe over double. So, OK, yeah, so we, we've established, yeah, this is super exciting. Theo uh, can be applied to uh, so many, you know, at our home, at the office, um, in industrial or at the warehouse, et cetera, at the office, right? Um, now let's let's backtrack to today. Um, you've decided to to uh, launch Theo in a Web three environment, right? Mm -hmm. and, yes. So even the Web three environment is a large space, right? Now, right. You know, if we sort of break it up into market segments or use cases, what's the first use case you, you decide yes. to apply yeah. Theo to? Let's, let's right. talk about today. Like, like what what can, what can Theo do today that wasn't able that we weren't able to do before theo it, it, oh yeah. yeah well what we're i mean we're starting with web3 as it currently exists and the most natural use cases are digital collectibles pfps you know and the other sorts of nfts that we see in-game items will be coming uh, fairly soon you know metaverse items this kind of thing metaverse real estate that'll be that'll be an interesting use case when that finally takes off um but you have web3 as it currently exists okay and what we can do it, for, for starters, and we see this now, we're really starting to actually take off um, with our, you know, our user counts are, are like, even, actually today we beat last week's user count already. So our user growth is starting to explode. Um, the medium to long tail NFT assets are all almost entirely illiquid, where if you were to look at the secondary market volume, like on, I believe that on OpenSea, 95% of collections have less than one ETH volume on the secondary market. They just don't move at all. And you, we saw the same sorts of things uh, like one stacks last summer when we started off. Um, I think it was 35% of the collections during our kind of trial period on stacks didn't sell a single time on the secondary markets, but they would move in our rooms all the time. 
So in the medium to long tail assets, we can create economic activity where previously there was very little or actually often none, literally none. We can get things to move. We're seeing that now with our AI proposed trades. We're on Solana. People are connecting their wallets. They have these NFTs that they couldn't sell, and they're able to very quickly, and really just a few clicks of a button, find trades that allow them to get rid of these assets they've been trying to sell that they can't sell. And maybe with for a little bit of money, they're able to get a new one. Maybe they actually get rid of the asset and they get a new one and they get a little bit of money. So the medium to long tail is moving now. That's, I think, the biggest contribution. Because when you think about Web3, it's dominated by whales. It's basically an economy for the rich when you think about Web3, it's especially when you're talking about the larger chains. So, so many people are just locked out because they don't have enough liquidity to participate. We give them a way in now by getting those medium to long tail assets to move, okay? Now, there is another use case, which is smart auctions, which is more of a high-end use case. We can talk about that as well. Um, but I'd say for now, the medium to long tail assets are what we're interested in. Yeah, no, I, I like how you broke that down because on one end of the spectrum, whether you have the cryptocurrencies on exchanges, right? And those are highly mm -hmm. liquid, right? Those mm -hmm. are highly liquid. Um, we don't have any problem with that. But in any economy, you have your illiquid goods or uh, products, right? Yes. And, um, and within the liquid category, some are more illiquid than others, right? Yes. Like, you said, right. like the, the ones that are worth like very little or the ones that are worth a lot, a lot, right? Mm hmm so it's, it's very interesting how you um, scientifically deduced and came to the richest or the most, um, I guess it's like the, the biggest pain, right? The, um, mm -hmm. the slow part. And then uh, with Theo, you, you've uh, sort of breathed life. And um, like, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? It's sort of like the speed of money. Like it's-, it's the velocity um, of money, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, velocity of money. So yep. you, you're you're increasing like the yeah the liquidity right of illiquid yeah. assets, which which, right. which is massive, which is massive. And yeah. I think it's a brilliant way to to um to start off right because what better place to do it than in the digital world, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that 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 is uh insanely awesome. Right. Thank you. So yeah. So this is this has been a long time in the making. It's uh, no no simple feat, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and uh, luck and some lucky investors have been able to invest in you in the previous rounds, right? And I'm sure uh, there'll be some more lucky investors that uh, could squeeze in, uh, perhaps mm -hmm. in future rounds. But even before this, right? It wasn't all fun and games, right? It wasn't all fun and games. Uh, like what, what were maybe you know I, to your journey to where you are today? Mm -hmm. What were the top three challenges that you had? That you had to overcome, right, to, to get mm -hmm. to where you are today. Yeah. Well, I would say that um, it kind of the history of our fundraising is that we started off. We raised five hundred thousand last May, fairly fairly easily. I would say. It was, I mean, in retrospect, like at the time, it seemed hard, but I have to say, in retrospect, it was relatively um, straightforward. We opened the second tranche of our pre-seed the very day that the Luna Terra situation blew up. Okay. And so suddenly it became much, much harder to raise money. And we had to really think our, rethink our whole fundraising strategy. And I would like to give credit to Alex Dunstan, who's one of our advisors. Oh, this would be some advice. Um, I don't know if it was just by luck or what, but I have managed to get a great group of advisors for NeoSwap. And I would highly recommend when people are getting started out, uh, find advisors. You know, we just give our, our advisors all get half a percent, just kind of, um, default, you know, different people give different levels, but that's just what we did to make it simple. Um, Alex Dunstan has been an advisor from the very beginning. Another one is Doug Scott, one of our early investors, also an excellent advisor. The two of them have helped me tremendously with networking. And Alex really helped me that week to reformulate our fundraising plan and figure out how are we going to navigate this like suddenly different environment. So uh, what we decided to do was we realized we had to get live on a bigger chain. We were on Stacks, which I love. I mean, you love Stacks too, I think, Albert. Like Stacks has a very, very bright future. But at the time, it was really a small, it was a small chain, very supportive, smart people, extremely enthusiastic. But you're not going to really get more for you know NFT trading. It's going to be hard to get more than 100, maybe maximum 200 users per week doing something like what we're doing. So we pretty quickly had maxed out on Stacks. We we're in a situation where we weren't going to be able to raise money just based on this idea. We had to get at least the promise of larger numbers. And so with Alex's help, we decided that we were going to expand to Solana right away. And uh, we announced that we we're going to do that. And based on that, a lot of, and a lot of networking, 
we just so much so many calls went out we were able to raise another one and a half million um through the end of last year and then this year we raised another 400 so i think that that time period because it was lunaterra and then i believe it was three arrows was next and then there were celsius and then the second hardest thing was the day that we launched on solana was the day that ftx blew up so then that became its own set of challenges so we had to get live on polygon but we did that and that helped with finishing the second tranche um so those are the first two, the, the the two hardest points the third one was this year we had to make a decision okay how are we going to get users how are we going to get traction on solana and we decided to launch the ai proposed trades really but i would say a little bit before we planned to but it was what we needed to do so we came up with a new plan and launched on uh solana and that's going great um yeah so all three times we were able to kind of keep going by making quick decisions and acting decisively nice nice thanks for sharing that with me uh and the audience so now that you've uh, overcome the first few challenges of the startup mm -hmm. uh uh, you guys are looking for growth now. Can you share with uh, the audience and, you know, there, there could be potential customers or strategic partners or even investors out there uh, mm -hmm. listening to to this uh, to this video. Um, mm -hmm. Can we start with who your potential or your best customers are? Uh, we talked mm -hmm. about that first stand. And I, yeah. I think uh, you painted a, a very uh, clear picture. Now, yeah. can you help with some more details on, you know, what type of customer should come up and use uh, NeoSwap? Yeah, well, I would say that, um, I mean, you know, we were talking about like the long-term vision, like we're building this economic brain. Right now we have our kind of product for Web3 as it is, then there'll be Web3 as it's going to be. We'll have a lot of B2B services. But as things currently exist with our current front end, our best customers, I would say, are, I mean, a lot of them are like the sort of stacks type users where you have open-minded, smart people who, who are looking, who appreciate new technology, and are willing to accept that a brand new thing is going to have it's going to have bumps on it, right? That this it's not going to be perfectly smooth. Now, someone wrote a really nice write up about uh, NeoSwap on Solana, and they said at the end, like, yes, the UX needs work, and I totally agree with that. But they were very positive about what we're doing. So, what our best customer, I would say, is someone who's excited about NFTs, has a lot of them, has experience in the space, uh, maybe isn't a whale, but is you know kind of middle-class sort of person who's interested in NFTs, who is able to understand that the product as it currently exists is not how the product is going to be, right? Someone who has patience. And actually, one of the decisions we made is we put NeoSwap beta. We put beta at the top to let people know this is not the final product. So that's what we want is somebody who is um, you know, kind of supportive, willing to share. You know, they're enthusiastic about trying new things and they're willing to share them with others and they'll come back every day and they'll kind of appreciate the progress that we're making every time. Nice. And how do, how do your users uh, use uh, NeoSwap beta? Can you share the yeah. website? Or the link? Um, yeah, sure. Um, do you want me to, you know, I could, I could do a trade. Would you like me to do one? I could, if I can share my screen. Yeah, actually, yeah, sure. That would be even better. Like how we walk through the whole thing, like just start with like, like yeah. a blank uh, web browser. And then type yeah, let, it me, in. let me do that. All right, type, yeah, I'll put it. Let me let me give you a screen share. Type it in. So okay. I just walk walk through it. No, that, All right, I'm always periodic about sharing my screen when I yeah that um, that is another slide. Uh, so a demo is this. worth a demo is worth a thousand pictures. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right, let me um, I'm gonna connect my Solana wallet here. Okay, so what you're gonna see here, share my screen. Yeah, do you have uh, screen sharing rights? I think you should know. Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's coming up. I just got it ready. Okay. So let me know if you see my screen. Do you, am uh -huh. I up? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so here I am. I'm, a, I'm on NeoSwap. Um, so it's neoswap.xyz is the link. So I'm going to press connect. Uh, I'm going to connect Phantom. All right, I think I put my password on clipboard. Here we go. I'm going to sign in. Okay, now you see we have different events. We actually have some um, ordinal auctions coming up next week. There'll be ordinal auctions on Bitcoin, in fact. Okay, so we have live events. Uh, we've got, they happen over a period of time. We have auctions. But the main product is this, the AI proposed trades, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press generate trade. So what Theo is doing is Theo is looking at my wallet, kind of profiling me, looking to see, um, you know, what items are available. And Theo is going to propose a trade. So this is just a wallet. It doesn't have very many high value items in it. It just has a little bit of soul. But it's asking me, okay, 
would you like to give up this NFT, this orc? Okay. For this NFT. Okay, that's good. Um, and so I'm going to give up this NFT. And I'm going to give this one up and get a little bit of soul. Okay, good. I like it. So I'm going to press accept. Now, it's going to take maybe 30 seconds to deploy to the blockchain. So maybe we can talk while the contract is getting. But it's a, on Solana, I think it's called a function call. It's going to call the function. And in a minute, I'll be able to sign. And then we'll have this trade. So I think that this is um, yeah, very easy to use. And people, people seem to like it. So what questions do you have about that while we wait for the contract? Yeah, so the, the participants uh is N Neo Swap or is that you? Well, this is me. Uh John E, that's me. And Neo Swap's here. So Neo Swap is sending now, over this. So yeah. when it says Neo Swap, yeah. it, it's oh yeah, yeah. N is Neo like, yeah. yeah, so but N is actually representing um other real users and they just and Neo Swap just found right. one of the users. Yeah. NFTs, right? Well, so it's, it's sort of like would, a marketplace, but like with AI. Yeah. Down the road, that'll be the case. So right now with this early version of the okay. uh, AI power trades, we have our own we have our own treasury and we're the counterparty. But we'll, what will eventually happen and happen actually fairly soon is that people will be able to connect their own wallets and pre-sign agreements. And then they'll be able to participate. And under the hood, what will be happening is a multi-way trade. So that's down the road. Um, I would say within that's exciting how, how far away is that or how close is that yeah i would say within three months we have the, we have the pre-signed contracts done um really it's more about working out a lot of this ux so here we go so i'm signing okay here we go okay so it's depositing here we go uh now right now neo swap will have to counter sign but um soon actually once we feel like everything's solid that'll just execute it so i'll get this so what'll happen is I'll get some soul on this NFT later today, and this one will have gone away. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of one-click, uh, you know, maybe five-click AI proposed trades product that uh, people are really enjoying. Super, super. So I can see who your users are now. Who are your strategic partners? You mm. know? I mean, who well, uh, definitely NFT product. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because this this looks like an ecosystem play. And yeah, definitely um it's gonna to tie together a lot of companies and make them more efficient. What what mm -hmm. what's what, yeah. what are your partners look like? Well, NFT uh, projects for sure. Uh artists and artist collectives, but, definitely. Like collections, right? Collections. Yeah, but yeah, so okay. you've got um sorry, yeah. So NFT projects like for example, Megapont, right? We we do a lot of stuff with Megapont on stacks. Um they can do they can do swaps for the community, they can do auctions, uh, they've done ordinal smart auctions. And coming soon will be a collection limited AI proposed trade where you will only be able to, the trades that are proposed will only involve items from the collection, okay? So that's something we're doing. We've got um, artists. We partner a lot with artists. We do smart auctions with artists. Soon it'll, you'll be able to specify an artist that you'd like to get, you know, there'll be certain art, artists that are, whose items are available and you can do trades for their items. Um, another one is marketplaces. We have a nice partnership with Gamma. We've done some smart auctions with Gamma. Doing a smart auction with Gamma next week, an ordinal smart auction over kind of Bitcoin Miami week. So that'll be going on. So those are the three big um, sets of partners. Now, games will be, games and virtual worlds will be, uh, I think, excellent partners for us uh, down the road. But there's just some technical things we have to work out before we really are ready for games. Yeah. I mean, games seems like a natural evolution because there are also a lot of NFTs in games, right? Yeah. And, and one more one is NFT lending protocols. Because anyone who wants to liquidate NFTs, this is a good way to do it. They'll, they will be market makers for us. They will have items they're trying to liquidate. And we'll help them to sell them in our events or in that put them into AI proposed trades. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now this is this is exciting. You guys are feeling a, a unique um, need in this uh, in the whole digital artifact space. I'm looking forward to to that um, the uh, two sided trading. Uh, yeah. Thought, yeah, you should try it. it we're, we're on Stacks, we're on Solana. Um, we'll be on Bitcoin very soon. So you'll be able to do AI proposed ordinal trading. That'll be happening soon. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and I, I can think about some collections that that uh, might want to cooperate with you. Are you hmm. in Miami? I'll be in Miami. Yeah. Yeah. All right. right. Well, let's, let's take the opportunity then. 
we're gonna yeah. we're gonna do a little party there. But before That's we get good. into that, um, let's continue with um, all the cool stuff on NeoSwap. Uh, you know, the the thing I'm really curious about is it. it well, you have this vision, right? Of mm -hmm. Like right now we're applying it to uh, NFTs and liquid NFTs and Web3, but um, from the sounds of it, Theo can be uh, extended to a lot of other things outside of Web3, right? Mm. As I mentioned, to the home, to the office, uh, uh, at the factory, et cetera, right? How, how, like in your mind, you know, how long is this going to take? Yeah. How long is this going to well, take? First off, Theo is much easier to do what Theo is doing in Web3, okay? Because on Web3, on blockchain, you have so much publicly available information. It's great for training our engines, okay? The other thing is, once you know what trade you want to execute, you can just write the contract and execute it. So when you're talking about digital assets or physical assets that whose ownership is recorded on chain, then that's a great use case. Like that, That is a really good way to go. And so I think that Web3 is going to continue to expand. Like we have a partnership with Materium whose NFTs represent ownership of physical items, okay? And we're going to be doing wine trading. In fact, the wine market is enormous. It's like $2 trillion or something like that. Um, people who want to trade wine, they're, they can have sometimes individual wine bottles, sometimes um, cases of wine, sometimes crates of wine, whose ownership is recorded with NFTs. They can trade those NFTs in our events or even in our AI proposed trades to move around the ownership of those physical items. So I think that we will be on Web3 for, I would guess, the next three to five years that will be just web three focused. It's just so much easier. I tried to do this in 2017 with Facebook marketplace. I think I mentioned that to you. Uh, and it's just really hard. So mm -hmm. it is a lot better if you have access to publicly available data that you know is up to date because you can look at it, right? Because if I propose a physical trade to you, but you don't have the item anymore, that's not very good. But on blockchain, we know what items you own right now. I can look in your wallet and see what you, I mean, assuming that you want me to, but like once you connect your wallet, we can see what you own right now. So there's many advantages. And so my view on the physical world is the easiest thing to do is just wait for the rest of the world to catch up. Let Web3 continue to expand and our market will expand. Now, it may come up that we have the opportunity to partner with someone like eBay or Amazon and we can integrate with them, but that's just going to be so much work. It's going to require so much time and money and work on their side. I wouldn't even want to do that until we get to Series B. Like It's going to be a lot better to just stay in Web3 where everything's interoperable, where you've got, doesn't matter where people got items, they can just bring them to our rooms or bring them to our website, or bring them to our partners' websites, and we can do the trades. So I would say, we my guess is three to five years at least, just Web3. Yeah, thanks for that. So I heard a few things there, but before I get into those, I just want to underscore something for all the entrepreneurs and founders out there. It's uh, I think everyone should learn from John on how he found the best place to start his startup, right? Um, and... In this case, it's because of the transparency of the blockchain um, that allows your your part to thrive, right? And I, I sort of heard, you know, I'm, I'm interpreting this, but you said not until Series B will you consider um, some Web two platforms, right? That's but my guess. That yeah. Means like, that means that well, like, there's a Series A here, right? Um, oh yeah. When are you, yeah. When 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 can investors get in on this? <laughs> okay. Well, well <laughs> the seed round. Yeah. Seed round will be later this year. Okay. okay. So we raised, you know, 2.4 million. We um, have some discussions going. We may, we may take a little bit more into our pre-seed. Um, we, yeah, we've met some partners recently we really like, and so we might take them on. But the seed round will be later this year. When that's over, we should have two years runway. So the Series A would really be late 2020. Uh, well, actually, it would be 2025, really. So that's when, series, yeah, so that's over the Series A. So Series B, you know, it's going to be. 2027, something like that. Wow. And by that time, there's going to be other technologies that you guys could be working with too. And yeah, I, that's I feel right. like things are getting faster and faster. So um, to wrap it up, John, um, can you share some, you know, you know, if you're maybe um, given the experience you have now, what would you have told yourself when you're first starting a startup? <laughs> like mm -hmm. what, what do you wish that you knew back then that you know now <laughs> mm. you know what are okay. the top two or three okay well i mean first off i would say it's been a great journey and i don't i don't regret any of it everything was learning experience and so um 
I'm grateful for my experiences. And so it's uh, the knowledge I would pass on is first off, seek mentors, incredibly important. Reach out, seek mentors, network with people, network on Twitter, network and, and behave professionally on Twitter. Okay. That's a big thing. Don't act the fool on Twitter because that'll come back to me. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, behave professionally, network with people, uh, reach out. You know, Trevor and I uh, connected before even the Sax Accelerator. There was some stuff going on with, with Megapont and, you know, I had concerns about it. And he and I talked and it was uh, great. I really got a chance to meet to meet Trevor. And I actually didn't even really know who he was. He was very gracious to meet with me. And now he's one of my main mentors. So, you know, reach out, talk to people. Robin from Liquidium has been very proactive about reaching out to me for advice. Very smart, I would say. That's a positive signal. Yeah. Even Robin is one of our startup lab teams. Yeah. 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 Um, talented. Yeah, he is for sure. And um, like even at Igora, I had a mentor, David Fields, who taught me so much. I, I mean, Igora, I, I would say without David, like David helped me to take a business that was basically really struggling and in retrospect might have failed. I mean, it wasn't going to fail because of my personality, but like it was struggling and um, it turned into, you know, it's a solid seven figure business with his advice. I mean, met he, you know, I went to a two day program with him about how to run a consulting company and eventually became, you know, really like more of a tech company. So get, seek mentors, seek knowledge. You know, I read uh, Ryan Breslow's book. This is some advice I would give to younger me, me for sure. Read Fundraising by Ryan Breslow. That book is so, so helpful, right? The way fundraising works is you network. This idea of fill out a million emails and send them out, and that is not how I would do it. I mean, we actually didn't have to raise a single dollar from outbound emails. We, um, I think I've sent one and I never heard back. That was it. Like network, that's the way to go. Um, yeah. That's probably So <laughs> yeah, that, that network, get advisors. Don't be afraid to give shares of your company to advisors who are helpful. You can have agreements that allow you to claw back the shares if a person doesn't do anything. I mean, you can have those kinds of agreements, but you need advice, you need mentors, you need a network. Uh, also, it's very hard. Starting a startup is about as hard as it gets. If you're on the fence, I mean, some people say, yeah, I mean, it's tricky. Like, I really think that if you don't feel like you were put on earth to do it, don't do it because it's so hard that like I was put on earth to do, to do NeoSwap. It's my mission. That's why I'm here. Like, I really believe that everything. How, how did you life. know? So let's, that, that is a really important thing. Like, how did, how did you find out though? Like, I'm sure there's, was there ever like a moment of doubt and how did you overcome that? How did you finally, oh, this is what I, I have to do or what I meant or what I meant to do? Yeah. I mean, I've been kind of following my heart or my nose for a while now. Um, certainly since I, yeah, it's weird. I don't know, but I've always had this thing where like when I relax and and like just calm down and listen i like hear i mean it's i don't know if it's what it is i had this feeling of what to do you know and i've just followed that throughout my whole life you know i was in santa barbara wrapping up my postdoc i was thinking about what to do and i was just in the shower at the gym and i was relaxed and i heard this voice in my set head that said go work from your dad's company so i did that and it was great training and then after a while i just started to get the feeling i needed to do ai like i needed to get into that so i went to some conferences i started igora um you know, and then after a while, I just had this feeling like I've got to work on NeoSwap, you know, and I've always like kind of followed that feeling. Now working on NeoSwap, I really see it uses all of my skills. Like I'm 46 now, you know, I have like, to be honest about it, I have a vast array of skills that I've acquired over the years doing all sorts of things, you know, because running a startup requires so many skills. You have to have administrative skills. You have to have people skills. You have to manage things. You have to be sales, sales all the time, right? You have to, so, I mean, I did Toastmasters at one point in my life that helped me. You know, I ran my nonprofit that helped with leadership. I mean, you have to have leadership skills, which is kind of like sales, but not exactly the same. Um, and that's before you even get into any of the technical skills that are required. You know, I mean, there's so many things that are needed. A younger me just couldn't have done it, I don't think. You know, I just didn't have the skills. What I was lacking was people skills, you know? So everything. I mean, I mean like my wife and I do, um, here's the thing, started doing marriage counseling once a week. That taught me all sorts of managerial skills. You know, like everything you're learning is going in to your brain and it's going to help you to do your job better so no productive work is ever wasted if you're learning stuff that stuff will eventually become it'll all start to combine at some point you'll be the only person in the world who can do something right i mean there's other people doing similar things i don't even think like i kind of keep an eye on what's going on with you know other people doing similar things but i don't look at it that closely because i don't care because i was put on earth to do this and we're doing it and this is what we're doing and other people can copy us if they want and i'm aware of it 
but I don't, you know, I don't see it that way. It's like, this is my unique thing. Nobody can do this as well as I can do it. I was put here to do it. And it's the combination of all that stuff, you know, that you want to, you, you want to try to look for several things that you're very good at and put them together and get something that only you can do. That will put you in a unique position. Um, okay, so there's just some thoughts. I mean, I can try to wrap it up, but do you have any questions or comments about any of that? No, that, that's very uh, interesting. When you, when you talked about accumulating skills and then one day that unique combination of skills makes you um, better than everyone else at that one thing. At, at the unique thing. That's the thing, yeah. is you've niched yeah. it down. Here's, here's a lesson. Um, I think Seth Godin, the marketing uh, kind of guru, says this. It is much better to be a big fish in a small pond than a, like, it just, this is a little bit, you have to be careful. You want to be in the right area, okay? If there's a trend going on, like AI or Web3 or whatever, leverage that. It's a good idea, okay? But it is much easier to be successful when you have status, okay? So for us, the decision to start on Stacks, which was relatively small, where we could get seen, we could talk to people, we could be important quickly, was very, very helpful right? So what Seth Godin says is you want to find the biggest pond in which you're still the biggest fish, okay? And then you, you get strength, and eventually then you can graduate and get to a bigger pond. And then you want to be the biggest fish there, and eventually graduate and get to a bigger pond. But, you, but if we had launched on Ethereum, no one would have noticed us. We would have failed, right? We'd just been this like little weird thing that nobody wanted to do, and it wouldn't have worked. So niche it down, find your like unique combination, and then lean into it. So I guess a really good point to wrap this up is uh, you mentioned Stacks, and as um, a lot of people in the audience know, Stacks is uh, built on Bitcoin. Mm. Why did you choose uh, Bitcoin first before? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah because well, first, because when yeah. you when you started this company, um, Ethereum was there's more users, there's more capital, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's already turning, right? Bitcoin was sort of stagnant mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. um, like you mentioned a little bit about being a big fish in a, like a growing pond, but like uh, why, why Bitcoin? Was there, there are a bunch of things? Thing? Well, first off, I've always been um, like I actually got into Bitcoin kind of late. I think I first bought Bitcoin in 2019, maybe is when the first time I bought Bitcoin. Um, I mean, I went to I went to a conference in 2017 where I was, you know, kind of I could have gotten involved in Bitcoin or Ethereum, but I, I just didn't for whatever reason. Um, but since I've gotten into Bitcoin, like starting in 2019, I've gotten very interested in the problem. Like if you read The Creature from Jekyll Island, I would recommend everybody read or listen to The Creature from Jekyll Island. You will understand central banks are at the heart of like 99% of the evil in the world. Like central banks are bad. They are really doing a lot of damage to the world. They funded, they funded all the wars. You just go through the history, you know, World War I. The U.S. got involved in World War I because J.P. Morgan was getting, gonna get into a lot of trouble when Britain wasn't going to be able to pay the war debts. So they went and, you know, staged the Lusitania, sent a bunch of innocent people to their death so they could get their debts paid. How evil does it get? It doesn't get more evil than that. But that's like the story of what's happened. And it's happened because of fiat currency. So that problem is like the central problem in society right now. Why is there so much division in society? It's because there's all this stress because there's all this theft going on thanks to fiat currency. So I like Bitcoin for that reason. I think Bitcoin is a, a real attempt to solve that problem. I think it's very good. Um, so when I saw Stacks, when I first started, I actually had learned about Muneeb in the book, Life After Google. I read about Muneeb and I was very interested in him. It was Blockstack back then. Um, but I didn't get involved until Stacks, the rebrand kind of happened. I got interested. And that was right around the time that I was trying to pick a chain for us to use for Neospot because we, we had been developing it. We realized we need to put it on chain. What chain should we go to? So I thought, all right, Stacks, small, exciting, full of really smart people, has a really an inspirational founder. Let's start there. One of the best decisions of my life. You know, some of this comes down to it. I don't know what it is about me. I've always been lucky. I've just always been very lucky. And that was just the right choice. Then Solana was lucky also. That's turning out to be a great choice now. Always met great people. So um, yeah, with Bitcoin, it just came down to they're trying to solve, like Bitcoin tries to solve the most important problem in the world. And Stacks, I think, is going to be when it's a true layer two a central part of the solution to that problem yeah no thank you that's well well said well said that that sums up nicely john thanks again and um thank you the audience for watching again this is john 
Ennis, CEO and co-founder of NeoSwap. Um, one of their flagship products is called Theo. Um, check it out on neoswap.xyz. N-E-O-S-W-A-P dot X-Y-Z. Check it out. Uh, don't mess out on it. It's um, in the beta version. It's growing very, very quickly. So yes. be you. And find me on Twitter. Yeah, yeah find, find John S. on Twitter. He's um, he's uh, benefited hugely from mentors, and he's also very open to help uh, young entrepreneurs. Um, one of our startup lab uh, teams, Robin, has already benefited greatly from your mentorship. So guys, don't be a stranger. Be a user, strategic partner, or investor. Uh, time, time to get with the program and check out NeoSwap. All right. That's Thank great. you, John. All right. Thanks, Albert.